Hey, if you're new to our church, this is a great Sunday to be here. Here's why. Last week we started this series called Team that, that is all about the church and the fact that the church is not a group of individuals, but the church is a team. I, I know the scriptures call it a, a, a family. They rarely use the word team, but not all of your family experiences have been fantastic. And so let's, let's just go with this. It, it's about team. Um, all of Philippians chapter 2 is about the team. And so here's, uh, here's why we're doing this series. There was a church 2,000 years ago in this little town called Philippi, and Paul writes them a letter. He helped them get started, and then he writes them a letter to say, hey, listen, a a as a group of people that gather to claim that you follow Jesus, it's super critical that you function as a team. And so chapter two of the letter of Philippians is all about how they can be a better team. You know why he wrote that? Because they had a tremendous capacity to screw it up. You know what's changed in the last 2,000 years for churches? Not that. We have a tremendous capacity to mess up the team. I mean, relationships are fragile. The unity of a group of people can be very, very breakable. And so here's our benefit. You and I get to read this letter that is written thousands of years ago that speaks to the very nature of who we are and our tremendous capacity to mess up the team. But it also gives us these recommendations if you want this team to win. If you really want to function in a way that honors God, there's some instructions in here about how this team should function best. By the way, I'm also doing this series because you don't just belong to a church team. You belong to a team that some people call family. Some of you lead teams at work or a part of teams at work. Some of you volunteer and you're part of a group of people. If you're doing anything in your life that makes you relate with other people, you're a part of a team. And I believe that, that Philippians chapter 2, if you read it and you keep asking the question, how can I be a great teammate? You will find God's truth in here about how your team should function best. Let me, let me start with this question. Um, what if you could build your own team? Some of you did. Um, I mean, if you're married, you at least picked one of the teammates, right? If you have a team that you, all, you hired at work, you pick the team. But that's not actually what I mean. I mean, what if you could like, you ever been to Build-A-Bear? You know, you fill it with stuffing and you pick the nose and the face and the, the sound that it makes. Like, you actually build it. What if you could take the teams that you're currently a part of and you could supernaturally give them traits and characteristics? I know you're thinking in your head, oh, kindness, gentleness. Like, you've got a whole list. Let me just read you a list. Tell me if you would want this on your team. Ready? Uh, they're situationally aware. <laughs> That means they have a, a high EQ. I mean, they have an emotional quotient that is like, I, I, they understand not just what's happening with the, the, the facts of a group, but like how people are doing in the group. Would you want that? Well, what about number two? They retain relationships. I mean, people like them. People gravitate to them. They don't actually repel other people, so they retain relationships. Would you want someone who puts other people first? Would you want someone who listened to you? How great would that be? You know, you're on your team and you said something and they actually heard you. That might be new for your team. Um, what about if they were curious, meaning you didn't have to always tell them what to do or tell them to stay focused or tell them, tell them to stay engaged. They were curious about what you were doing. They spoke their mind and not in a way like, I'm going to give you a piece of my mind. I mean, in a way that's like, no, I really want to communicate with you what I'm thinking. Would you want the character quality of someone who said thank you? You might feel appreciated on that team. Um, what about someone who had an abundance mentality? And what I mean by that is this. Um, for some people, in order for them to win, you have to lose. That's a scarcity mentality. That means there's not enough praise, there's not enough of anything to go around. But people with an abundance mentality, they believe that it's win-win. Like you can win, they can win, and we can celebrate our wins together. What about somebody who accepts feedback? Okay, if you're a manager at work, uh, how did it go the last time you gave feedback? Um, I would say at least 50% of them just don't go well. Why? Because people get defensive. Oh, why are you being so critical of me? What would you take this character quality? Assumes responsibility. Like if it goes wrong and that, was, that ball was in their court, they go, hey, that was, that was my bad. What about somebody who asks for help? Question, would you not want any of these qualities? I mean, aren't all of these things that you go, that would make a great team? You know where I got the list from? Forbes. 2015, in an article all on the humility of a team. You see, all of these character qualities that we're going to read today in Philippians chapter 2, and a lot of the principles I just read to you come from Philippians chapter 2. 
some other people outside of the Christian faith discovered them and like, oh, look, new principles. We should write about them in 2015. They've been around for thousands of years. When I read this, they all happen because of humility. Humility is the foundation for where all these other qualities grow up. So um, here we go. If you have a Bible, open up to Philippians chapter 2. We're going to start reading in verse 3. But let me um, give you a quick maybe personal note about why this is important to me. Uh, a few years ago, as I, was, I was asked to speak at a gathering. And at this gathering where I was going to speak, they said, would you speak on preaching? Like, how do you communicate the Word of God to people? And so I was like, well, fantastic. I do that a lot, and sometimes I do okay at it. I'd be happy to speak to this group. They said, okay, here, here's your audience. Um, it's a bunch of newbies. I, not new to the faith, but like they're new to ministry. Like, they're just kind of getting started. They're just getting going. Would you speak to them? And so my thought was this, okay, I'd be happy to. I got a 15-minute talk, and then there's going to be two other people following me. They're each going to give 15-minute talks. So I'm thinking, for these newbies, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take the basics of like preaching and how to communicate God's Word. We're going to put them on the bottom shelf so that I'm not speaking over the heads of anybody in the room. And so I prepped. I made my notes, got my hand out, created my slide deck, and I showed up to the event. And I was thinking there were probably going to be like 20 people there. Well, there are about three times as many. And I started looking around, and you can identify, okay, kind of new to preaching, new to preaching, new to young, young, new to preaching. But then I started looking around the room. I was like, I know that guy. In fact, that guy over there is a lead pastor from a church right across town. I kept scanning the room. Like, there were lead pastors all over the room. Not only that, but as I'm, as I'm, my, my heart rate is going up at this point, and I keep scanning the room. I start picking out seminary professors who teach on preaching. I was mad. Because the guy who who told me about this, this opportunity, he just set me up for failure because I'm thinking I can't take my romper room version of preaching that I was about to preach and like go out there and share it with them because they're gonna think like, are you kidding me? But I couldn't change my notes, couldn't change my handout, I couldn't change my slide deck, and so I just, in that moment, I'm like, I, I just got to give them what I got and, and, and present it, and partway through, man, I could just feel the pressure of those who were like veteran pastors, seminary professors, sitting in their, chair, chance, in their chairs just going, really, 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 that's the best you got? Uh, your 15 minutes of being able to teach on preaching, and that's what you gave us? Totally underwhelming. So I just delivered it. I tell you that whole story because of this. There are two kinds of people in the world. There are the humble, and there are those who are about to be. So today I'm going to invite you to make a choice. Uh, You can practice humility, or you can get ready to prepare for being humbled. Because there's really just two kinds of people in this world. So as I read this, Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. Here's Paul's advice to this church. On humility, he says this Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, there's the foundation, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. So here, here's what Paul does the whole chapter is about humility. And in there, he says, Here's some things you can do to, out of humility to build the team. And then he says, Here's some things that you can do that will bust up the team. So here's how we're going to frame this. Ready? It's in your notes. There's some team builders and some team busters. Here's, let's just go for the busters first, okay? Here's things, if you really want to screw up your family, you really want to screw up your workplace, you really want to screw up whatever team you're part of, you want to screw up your community group, you want to screw up the church, here it is. Do these four things. Ready? Here we go. First one is this. Selfish ambition. What is it? It's when I say that I value humility, but here's what I want. I just really want kudos, (laughs) I want the credit, I want the recognition, I want the appreciation. On that day when I prepared the wrong talk, because I, I, I wasn't clear about who my audience was, do you know who I was thinking about? Me. I was thinking about me. I was thinking about what will my reputation be like amongst the pastors? Like, oh, remember that guy? He was the guy that bombed that talk. He was the guy who, I was thinking just about me and how I could preserve my image. Question, what if I would have changed the question from how do I protect me or how do I make myself look better? Because all of those people, they came there for help that day. And what if I just asked the question, okay, there's a bunch of people in the room. 
all of them are either trying to get better at preaching or they're, they're, they're good at preaching and just want to get a little bit better. What is, the, what is the value that I could add to them? How could I help them just in one little small way get better? The difference between those two questions of how can I preserve my reputation and how can I make them get better is this. I'm actually focused on them. What do they need? What do they care about? And it's not actually about me at all. I just wonder how much of our team experience is really about us and isn't really about caring about them. In, in Paul's letter that he writes to this church in Philippi, some of the members, I'm guaranteeing, as they, they gathered together and they, they met together on a on a Sunday, I guarantee some of them came and they thought, man, when we gather, when we get together, I wonder if anyone will talk to me. I wonder if anybody will welcome me in. I wonder if they're going to ask me to serve in the nursery. <laughs> I wonder if they're going to ask me to serve too much, to give too much. I wonder if they're gonna, just going to like expect me to do all these things. I wonder if they're actually going to love me, if I'm going to belong, if they're going to welcome me in. See, human nature is this. We are concerned about us. It's natural. But the Christian life is not a natural life. The Christian life is a supernatural life. So Paul just says this. Don't do anything out of selfish ambition. Just think about yourself less and start thinking about the other people around you. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. What's vain conceit? It's, here it is. It, it's when I want good for you. But what I want for you... I actually want just a little bit more for me. <laughs> Vain conceit is that I'm more important. I think about myself more often than I actually think about you. Um, I'll give you an example. The team that some of us call marriage, right? Th that's a team. That team is constantly in negotiations. Am I right? You're negotiating, you're negotiating where you will go out to eat, where you're going to go on vacation, how you're going to spend the end of the year bonus, which family you're going to spend Christmas with, and which ones you will always avoid. These are negotiations. Am I right? Don't, don't start talking amongst yourselves, like pointing fingers. Like what next car you're going to buy? The next time you're going to have sex. Got quiet. It's a negotiation. Or maybe there's something less important, but still, you know, it, it sits in your relationship. Like, um, mm, I don't know, maybe you're negotiating, are we going to go shopping at Costco, Trader Joe's, or Whole Foods? Or God forbid, all three in one day. <laughs> Can we just go home? Your team that you call marriage is in a constant negotiation. Here's the problem with negotiation. Are you ready? This is not complicated at all. You want what you want, here it is, because you really want it. You want what you want because you really want it. And you know why you want it? You might write this down because it's a little confusing. Ready? You want it because it's better. You're not writing it down. I, okay. You want it. You know why? Because it's better. Your spouse is just, just a little confused because if they weren't confused and they were thinking clearly, they would want what you want because what you want is better, right? The problem with humility is this. If you don't voice your opinion, your thought, or if you give way to thinking about them, here's the problem with humility. I don't want to be last. I don't want to be left out. I don't want to go without. I don't want to get picked last. I don't want to miss opportunities. I don't want to go unnoticed. I don't want to lose out. There's a problem with humility. The problem with humility is it's going to cost us more than we ever want it to cost us. And if I choose humility, there's no guarantee that the team is going to look back at me and go, oh, you are so humble. You know, we should really give you what you want. And my kids may never carry me off the field on their shoulders, right? And oh, dad, you're the hero. If you're humble and you put somebody else's needs ahead of your own, you might actually go without. In humility? It might actually cost you more than you ever wanted it to. Go back to chapter 2 of Philippians. After Paul points out these team busters, he then goes into this, um, this description of the greatest team player, the greatest person of humility that ever existed. Spoiler, 
spoiler alert here, it's Jesus. Um, Here's what he says. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. So he sets Jesus up as as this hero. Now, stop for a minute. I'm going to dig into this next week about how Jesus is our ultimate example of humility. And so I'm not setting aside Jesus. I'm just, we're going to talk about the team busters and team builders today. And we're going to come back to that and spend a whole Sunday just on that. But he goes on after the section that's all about Christ and his humility. Look at verse 14. Because he gives us two more team busters right on the way. He says this, do everything without grumbling or arguing. Not some things. Do everything without grumbling or arguing. So what's grumbling? Here it is. I'm happy or I'm helpful, but I'm not happy. I'm going to be helpful, but I am not happy about it. And we're just going to call this false humility. It's that time where someone asks you to do something and you oblige them, you go through with it, and you're helpful, but you are not happy about it. There is no joy, and so you grumble. Two ways to grumble. Ready? One is externally. This is super easy because it comes out your mouth. (laughs) It's super easy to recognize. I think it's really hard to change. One of my pet peeves that made me not such a great team player in my family growing up was that I really liked to be on time. Anybody else in the room? Yeah, there's some people. You you know why you like to be on time? It's because you're wired that way. You know why I like to be on time? Because I'm wired that way. You know why I'm wired that way? It's because Jesus was wired that way. It's the right way to be wired. To be on time. I had three sisters. Not all my sisters were wired that way. They came to us defective, but we couldn't send them back. (laughs) And there may have been a time or two that I may have slightly grumbled at them. You know, they're in the bathroom getting ready. You just knock on the door, throw it open, and be like, are you kidding me? More makeup is not going to help that face. Let's go. (laughs) I was not a very kind 12-year-old or 13, or 14, or 15 for that matter. (laughs) But let me ask you a question. We can make fun of me, but let's make fun of you for just a moment too. If it doesn't happen how you thought it should happen, or when you thought it should happen, are you no longer delightful? Just a quick thought for you that maybe if you just put up with it, but yet you're externally grumbling to somebody. Maybe this is exactly what Paul is talking about. That even if you do the right thing with the wrong mouth, it's not actually building the team, it's actually busting the team. But it's not just external grumbling, there's an internal grumbling too. Um, Some of you might not even recognize that you're an internal grumbler. Some of you might think it very holy and very spiritual to do the right thing and just go, "Mm." no words of grumbling, just "Mm." you're helpful, but you are not happy. Let me um, see if I can help you put your finger on whether you're an internal grumbler or not. You keep track and you keep score on how much you do and how much they do, and they're always behind. They never contribute as much as you do, and maybe it's true, but the very fact that you're keeping score, you're an internal grumbler. Sometimes when you feel like you've reached the limit of what you've given, you're just bitter and you're resentful. And you're angry at them because no one cares like you care. No one serves like you serve. Can I just say this? That's internal grumbling. It may never come out your mouth, but it sits within your soul and it will poison your soul. Do everything without grumbling or arguing. So so what's arguing? uh, Here it is. I, I just, this is my own definition. Let me just give it to you. It's when my opinions are more important than the unity of the team. (laughs) Um, Is what I'm about to say necessary for the unity and direction of the team? It's kind of a weird question because in our social media culture, it's not about, we never ask the question is, what I'm about to say helpful. We usually ask the question is, I have a right to say something, don't I? I mean, this was in the media all this last week when an NBA Houston Rockets general manager tweets something out about supporting the protest in China. Boom! Almost all the deals in China with the NBA got shut down overnight. Why? You're not allowed to speak stuff like that. But in the U.S., we're like, in our culture, it's like, well, you just, you're, I have the right to speak. 
I, I know, we, we do, but let's not take the American dream and pretend it's the Christian best. What if our right to speak isn't actually helpful to speak? When he says arguing, maybe when we voice our opinion, that begins the foundation for an argument. And my, what if we just choose words of kindness and encouragement? And I'm not saying that we can never express our opinions. But every time you express your opinion, did it actually build up the team and help the team? Now, now don't get me wrong with this, okay? <laughs> I know there's going to be some people who go home and be like, to their spouse or their team, they're like, listen, every time you share something, you know, it just leads to an argument, so stop talking. That's not what I'm saying. <laughs> it's great for teams to go through that disequilibrium and that conflict so they can come out richer and deeper and more loved on the other side. But I'm just not convinced that arguing, that if we're not just laying the groundwork for it by stating our opinions. Team builders, let's switch gears. We talked about uh, grumbling, arguing. Paul switches to these team builders. If you go back to verse 3 in chapter 2, he says this, Rather in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Under that phrase, valuing others above yourselves, um, this is the first team builder. I'm going to put this in my own language just so that hopefully it sticks with us a little bit. Here's what I think it means to value others above yourselves. I think it's being curious and concerned. See, Humility, some people translate it as you need to degrade yourself or think of yourself really, really low. Let, make this clear. Humility is not thinking less of yourself, but it's thinking of yourself less. Meaning you're just not focused on yourself. And if you're not focused on yourself, you have the time and the opportunity to be curious about the people around you. You've met these people, right? I mean, maybe the first time you went out to coffee, the first time you went out to lunch, the first time you had an opportunity to connect, and they didn't ask anything about you. They're not curious about you. You know what they're curious about? Sharing themselves with you. They tell a story about their life, and then they paused, and you thought, oh, this is an opportunity for me to share a little bit more about my life, and you were wrong. They were just taking a breath. Because they had another story or another thought or another fact that they wanted to speak. Because they're not curious about you. They're not concerned about you. So if we're going to value other people above ourselves, be curious about people. When you walked in this morning, you walked through this lobby, did you walk around and just go, I'm really curious about the people in the room. Are you curious enough to join a community group where you're not so sweating like who you are and will people like me, but you're like, I, I get an opportunity to meet with these 8, 9, 11 people, and I get to know them. Are you curious about them? And then when they share something and maybe life isn't going well, are you concerned about them? Are you concerned to the point where you can say, I'm not just going to be curious or be concerned, but I'm going to be helpful. Because I think that's where Paul goes in, in the second part here. Be helpful. If he says, value other people, and then he says, look out for the interests of others, what does that mean? Simple terms. Be helpful. When they run into a problem, if they run into a situation, do something that helps them. There's a guy by the name of Dale Schroeder. His picture's on the screen. He grew up in Iowa. Super poor family. Growing up, he always wanted to go to college, but he just couldn't afford to go to college. So he became a carpenter, pick up the trade, and he worked in the same company for over 50 years. He was one of those guys that, that brought the black lunch pail to work, the same lunch pail for 50 years. And, and it, that's just kind of the guy that he was. People said this about Dale. They said he has two pairs of jeans. He has a pair of jeans he wears to work and a pair of jeans that he wears to church. Drives an old rusty Chevy truck because he couldn't afford a Toyota Tundra. That's what I drive, sorry. <laughs> Dale never married. He was single. Had no kids. Uh, Dale, towards the end of his life, approached a friend of his named Steve. And he said, Steve, um, I'm just curious if you could help me. Steve was a lawyer. He said, Steve, um, uh, I've been saving money all these years. And I'm wondering if we could take my life savings. And when I'm gone, could you help people in a way that I wasn't able to be helped? He said, I've always wanted to go to college, but I just couldn't. I mean, I just, I was single, nobody there to support me, didn't have much of a family. And so um, I would love it if we could, you know, take my life savings and would you disperse it to, to help people go to college who need that? 
Well, Steve is kind of intrigued by this. He's like, well, how much money are we actually talking about? He goes, well, I have almost $3 million. Steve's jaw kind of hit the floor. and He said, absolutely. Well, in uh, 2005, Dale passed away. The gal on the screen here, her name is Kira Conrad. She was raised by a single mom. She had three sisters herself. And being the youngest of four girls, there was no extra money around. She was super smart, though. I mean, skated through school. She got great grades. She had the grades to go to college, get a PhD, do whatever she wanted. Her dream was to be a therapist. She graduates from high school, and at her graduation party, the night before, she's preparing like a little speech, kind of for the for the group, but her speech is, hey, listen, I've always dreamt of this, but here's the reality. I thank you all for coming, but I'm just letting you know, like, I'm not going to go to college. We just can't afford it. That was her, that was her speech and the night before her party. She gets a phone call from Steve that says, we know who you are. We've heard your story. We would love to give you $80,000 of tuition money so you could go to college. Um, this year, 2019, Dale's money ran out. All three million, gone. <laughs> but it was interesting because um, there were 33 lives that were changed in the last 14 years. And those 33 lives, each of them received tuition money so that they could go to college and receive the very thing that Dale couldn't afford for himself. And those 33 people got together this last July... And they got together at a party with the black lunch pail to celebrate Dale's life and tell the stories about how this man's humility, generosity, and kindness changed their lives. The only caveat was this. If you were going to accept Dale's gift, you would have to, when you got through with your education, consider other people's needs so that you could give back to them. It might not be an entire college tuition, and people might know it as this term of paying it forward, but would you just be, in all humility, considerate of the needs of the people around you and be generous and kind towards them? So these people all got together, and they shared this story and this gift that Dale gave them. Let me make this clear. 2,000 years ago, there was a single man who was a carpenter, who set the bar on what humility looked like. He set aside his rights. He died on the cross so that we could be gifted with forgiveness, salvation that we could never earn on our own. And 2,000 years after that, there was a single man who was also a carpenter who did something to emulate Jesus' humility as he looked out for the interests of others. You know what I find fascinating about Dale's story? And it's a little humbling for me. Is that Dale gave because he went without. Dale gave because he went without. And my family, um, we give. I mean, right off the top, gross, you know, biggest number before taxes are taken out. Like, we give 10% of that and just give it to church. And like, that's where our starting place is. And I don't say that to brag because of this. Most of the other giving we do above and beyond that in my family, it's not because I went without, it's actually because I have a surplus. I'm not sure that's humility. I know some of you are thinking, well, you're talking about generosity, you're talking about kindness. No, 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 no. The foundation undergirding generosity and kindness is humility because if you don't value other people or consider the interests that you have, you will never even recognize opportunities for generosity. You'll not recognize opportunities for kindness because you won't even see the needs around you. I've given things in my life out of my surplus rather than what I've gone without. And I think it's humbling and I just think it's worth asking, have we ever gone without? In order to show through humility that kind of kindness and generosity to other people. Can I ask you a question? Instead of introspecting, looking at yourself, let, let me ask you this. Has anybody showed you this kind of kindness? Uh, let me ask it this way. I'll bet you that in your faith journey or your journey with the church, there have been people that you have recognized that have this kind of humility. Maybe they don't have the $3 million to set people up with college, but they've given sacrificially. 
Uh, they've given their love. They've given their affection. They've given a shoulder to cry on. They have listened to you. They spent time with you. Who are the people who, because of their humility, have changed your walk with Christ? If somebody comes to mind, can I ask you to do me a favor? Please, 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 please do this. Um, would you just send me an email and write me like a one-minute story? What's their name? And what was the thing that they did that showed great humility in their life? There's people who've been sacrificially giving and serving this church for over 40 years. Some of you are in this room. Maybe the person you're thinking about is not even connected to this church at all. Would you tell me their story? Scott at churchonthehill.com. Super easy to find, all right? Maybe even better, would you do this? Would you take your camera and put it on video and just shoot a selfie? And for one minute, I want you to tell me who they are. Give me their name and just tell me their story. Because two weeks from today, we want to brag about them just a little bit. Okay, so don't tell them you're doing this. But just send it to me. So this series is four weeks long. If it's only going to be three, it's your fault. Because it means you didn't send me anything, all right? So send me an email, send me a video, and we would love to brag about them, and I'll tell you why in two weeks. Um, I want to finish this, the last team builder, it's this. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 16, halfway through, you'll see it on the screen, it says this, uh, Paul is writing to this church, he says, and then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. Now, I think what he's trying to say here is, listen, I made this huge effort with you to come and share Christ so that this church could form, so that you could be saved, so that we can make a difference in your life, so that your life might be changed, not just now with Christ, but for eternity. Your eternity would be changed. And he's saying, I don't think I did that in vain. You're a changed group of people. He goes on to say this. But even if I'm being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith. I mean, Paul's writing this from prison. He's saying that the great sacrifice he might make is his own death. And what he's trying to say is, it's all going to be worth it if I could bless you and encourage you and that your life would be different. And then he says this, I am glad when he made this sacrifice so that other people could come to Christ and this church in Philippi could form, he's like, I'm, I'm glad and rejoice with all of you so you too should be glad and rejoice with me. Hey, if you're going to build a team and you're going to be a part of exercising humility in the group, here it is, celebrating when others succeed. Paul's like, my life could end right here in this prison, but you know what? It's all worth it. The sacrifice, the help, the service that I've given, it's all worth it if a single life could be changed. And I just wonder, I wonder why it's so hard for us to celebrate when others win. The truth is, I, I think it's because of chapter 2 that we just lack humility. Can we genuinely, not just on the outside, but on the inside, celebrate when others win? Even if it means you didn't get the trophy, you didn't get the bonus, you didn't get the applause, or the pre appreciation, or you didn't get the, the video that someone sent in about you. Can we celebrate? So as team builders, can we be curious and concerned, be helpful and celebrate when others succeed? Here's what I want to do. Sometimes there's messages you give and you give it and you walk off and you go, that was a great Sunday. Move on to the next thing. This isn't one of those. Here's what I want to do. I want to practice for the next two weeks. Humility. By practicing team builders and recognizing when we do team busters. So here's what we're going to do. When you came in, hopefully you got a program, and maybe you got one of these bracelets as you came in. It's gray, white, black, whichever one you got. Um, here's what I want you to do. Take that out. I want you to put it on your wrist. If you're right-handed, put it on your right hand. If you're left-handed, you can put it on your left hand. There's no right, no wrong, okay? All you left-handed people, you'll be slighted all your life, right? You put it on whatever hand you want. That's your humility arm. You put that bracelet on, and you keep it on your humility arm until... You do something where you just put your wants and your desires in front of somebody else's. I mean, look back to those team busters. The moment you do a team buster, I'm going to encourage you to do this. You can take it off this arm and you're going to put it on this wrist. That's the, that's the non-humility arm, right? That, that, is, that is the team buster arm. I want you to switch it. And the only way you can switch it back to your other wrist is this. You have to do one of the team builders. You have to consider somebody else, show curiosity, show concern, be helpful, celebrate one of their wins. And I just want you to pay attention for two weeks, okay? This series ends in two weeks. I want you to pay attention how often 
It's on your humility wrist and how often it's over here and how many times a day it goes back and forth. Here's why. I think it's one thing to come into a message like this and be challenged mentally with, with what humility looks like and what Christ is calling his family, his team to be. But I think it's another thing to put it into practice. I guarantee if you put this on and you try this, that, that I think what you're going to find is you're going to be much more aware of how much you want what you want because you think it's better and how much more you can give to people when they're your first thought, not your last concern. And so that's my invitation to you. I hope you'll practice this for two weeks, engage in this. I just think this, if you'd engage in this, it'll change our church, it'll change the community group. I think it'll change your work environment and I think it might even change your family if we're all showing more humility together. Are you up for this? All right, for both of you, who are joining me in this. Fantastic. For the rest of you, I, you're an internal processor. I get it. I know you're all in. Let's pray. God, thanks for these folks. I thank you for the humility that they have, that they're willing to come every Sunday and sit and listen and absorb and say, God, how can I honor you with my life? So God, give us wisdom in these next weeks to come. Give us eyes to see opportunities to care for people and exercise humility. God, even if we do the right thing and don't have the right heart, we would ask that you would change our hearts slowly but surely to have the kind of humility that Christ did when he gave up everything so that we become your family. Make us more like that. If you agree, would you say amen?